Ladies and gentlemen, this is not the first time that I am making a speech at that forum. I would like to welcome all the guests of Ukraine, especially those who are here for the first time, uh, who are for the first time at this forum. The the topic of the uh, forum is the European strategy of Ukraine, and we'll be talking about European dimension of our policy. And uh, uh, we are close to the signing of the association agreement between Ukraine and European Union on the 28th of November in Vilnius. We are planning uh, to uh, uh, sign this historic act. Uh, that includes the free trade uh, zone agreement, the agreement on political association, on visa-free regime. We've been approaching that for many years. That's the decision of not one year, not one day. Different uh, governments and the two presidents were working on that, and before that were working consistently on European integration of Ukraine. That's why this decision is not uh, something unexpected for Ukraine. And talking about its uh, economic development, first of all, we were trying to conduct economic reforms which would make Ukraine closer to European Union, closer to this level of investments, the level of investment attractiveness that uh, the countries of European Union have. I'm thinking about one of the good examples, and I would like to share with you uh, a story about uh, the decision made a few years ago about introducing GMP standards for our pharmaceutical uh, industry, European quality standards for medicines. It was so difficult to uh, pass that decision. Our producers, the competitors, uh, who were flooding our market with medicines from everywhere, Bangladesh, India. I respect India very much, but I do not really respect some uh, uh, companies which uh, are not uh, official companies. And despite all this opposition from the comp uh, competitors, uh, those who were um, uh, interested uh, and who were attracting some problems, uh, some uh, disasters. Uh, uh, despite all that, we have these norms uh, already applied. We increased uh, the export by 51 percent. Our prices did not go up. They were stabilized. And we uh, reoriented our consumer who did not trust Ukrainian medicines before. Now, uh, everyone uh, is interested in our products because uh, our products have lower price but a very good quality. You understand how important this step was. Uh, why I am saying that? Because now we have to do much uh, larger scale work. We need to uh, reorient orient uh, all our uh, norms and uh, standards. We need to introduce European standards of quality, and that requires a lot of funding, a lot of efforts. I remember my discussion with the Prime Minister Medvedev uh, of Russia. Uh, he said, as soon as you move to these uh, standards, uh, what will be Come, uh, your products will become not compatible with the products of the countries of European Union because we are doing unification of uh, technical standards. And then I asked a very diplomatic question to him, and which direction are you moving? Uh, how are you modernizing your norms of technical regulations and technical standards? Maybe you want to be closer to Bangladesh or to Pakistan? No. Then where are you going? Uh, we also would like to have European standards and norms. Then if you want it and we want it, what uh, is uh, an obstacle for us to come to an agreement? Maybe an obstacle now is, uh, as I understand, is a certain political 
understanding of what Ukraine should be. We have decided on that. As I have already said, that was decided by the whole course of our political uh, development. Uh, we, for ourselves, uh, decided that. We made that decision uh, when defining our strategies, uh, when defining our policies. We need to think about that. Uh, and these are to be based on these factors. The reforms are related to deregulation. They are difficult reforms. And uh, uh, it's uh, quite strange, but uh, uh, basically those who are to implement the reforms very often oppose them. You understand that? Uh, at the level of the highest leadership, the president, the prime minister, they want to conduct reforms. But when it comes to, for example, passing certain deregulations by the ministry, by the agency, they start telling us if we change that norm, there will be a collapse in the country or chaos in the country. Uh, so um, we have changed the three uh, quarters of them, and there's no collapse. But on the other hand, there's no big improvement. And I'm asking a question. Why, um, uh, after we have amended uh, uh, so many norms, uh, uh, especially uh, when it comes to entrepreneurship activity, but we see no significant improvement? And I will answer that question in such a way. For example, we pass a law, and then the deregulative act is passed. But then there are some bylaws and some other documents which basically um, lead to some problems. We should understand that we need to work long and very carefully to approach the European level of deregulation. I'm not idealizing the uh, regime in the countries of European Union, because I see a lot of bureaucracy there, and I see how slowly the decisions are made there. We have a very good, so to say, in inverted commas, uh, experience of work with the European Commission. And uh, uh, to call them, uh, it's very difficult to call them the democratic body. I don't want the uh, civil servants, uh, the people working in the European Commission to think that I'm criticizing. But on the other hand, we do have bureaucracy. Bureaucracy is everywhere. We do have it in our country. But uh, now when it, uh, uh, now it's trying to get adapted to the uh, current situation, and we need to put more efforts to, to that. We uh, are also doing a lot, and I believe Mr. Boyka uh, has already mm, mentioned that, uh, the Vice Prime Minister. But we are doing a lot uh, um, with diversification of supply, with uh, our own gas uh, and oil production, with the uh, use of the uh, fields, which uh, are old fields. I had a very interesting conversation with the Shell specialists, and they were talking about new technologies, how to operate the depleted fields. They're depleted from the point of view of the 60s, but they're not depleted thinking about, about our today's uh, opportunities. So some of the abandoned fields uh, in Kharkov Oblast, in Sumy Oblast, uh, those which were producing 70 billion cubic meters of natural gas, uh, now when we apply new technologies, they will allow us to produce a lot of gas. We have finally drilled the, the first well uh, on a shale uh, field. That first uh, well is so important, it's difficult. Uh, this is related to lots of risks. Any uh, serious uh, uh, thing is related to risks. In the economy, there are nothing which wouldn't be related to risks. But 
We need to uh, do everything to have such operations uh, safely, especially when it comes to such places as Yuzevsky Field in Kharkiv Oblast, which is densely populated. That is uh, where a lot of financial resources and a lot of time is required, especially the time factor is important. Within this 30, uh, uh, three and a half years, we have reduced our purchase of gas from 41 billion to 25 billion cubic meters, and we say to our Russian colleagues, if the contract is not amended, is not modernized, then we'll be reducing in the future the purchase of Russian gas. Who will win? Probably we will uh, both lose, both Russia and Ukraine. Russia, because they will lose uh, the biggest consumer of gas. We will lose because we will have to put our resources uh, which we could use for modernization of our economy uh, historically. And um, we suggest we should be trying to get a win-win situation. Russia is uh, supplying about 150 uh, billion cubic meters of gas to Europe. Our gas transportation system is oriented also to 150 billion cubic meters. After modernization, if it's modernized, we'll be able to uh, transport 200 BCM if the need is. But uh, during the last year, the volume of transportation uh, uh, was reduced uh, a lot, and now we are operating this huge system by approximately 60% of its capacity. And that means also costs, our costs. And I'm asking the question to European Commission, when they have such an opportunity, why should Ukraine be paying so much for that? Maybe we should uh, just uh, uh, close down two uh, uh, pipelines, two sections of pipeline, and leave just 50 BCM, and that will be enough for us. If the if Europe and Russia both need this system, let's make a decision. If they don't need it, we will also make a decision. But Ukraine cannot, uh, on its own, uh, pay so much. And we um, joined the European Energy Charter, and uh, certain politicians were very unhappy, but we did it because we believed that we will be addressing all the energy issues together. But we uh, failed to do that jointly. The European Union, European Commission are very interested in gas uh, supply diversification to European countries. It's great that Azerbaijan is now constructing the Trans-Adriatic gas pipeline and others. And the South Stream is also good for European Union. But uh, what is, does it mean for us? was this mutually beneficial approach. That is why it's not, uh, not everything is so easy in the European strategy. There are not just uh, roses, there are thorns as well. If we are realists, we need to at least cut off the thorns. At the same time, another aspect of our current, first of all, economic problems is worth paying attention to. It's told that by signing agreement on association with European Union and concluding free trade area agreement, Ukraine will turn into a transit country of duty-free transit country to supply goods to custom union countries. And we are told directly, if that happens, then the custom union will be forced to put barriers, putting some protective mechanisms in place. Hypothetically, such a possibility does exist. 
I emphasize it's only hypothetical, but practically when we tell to our partners, please tell me which commodities you worry about, please show us calculations, which commodity all of a sudden will increase two times transit through our joint borders. We have already free trade aid agreements with two dozens of countries. Recently, just a year ago, we signed FTA agreement with countries of Association of European Trade, four countries of them. Nobody was asking questions like that. While one of the members of this association is Norway, which is supplying huge volumes of fish to Russian Federation, has it reoriented its transit via Ukraine? Have they started moving their fish through Ukraine? No, not at all. The transit delivery has not increased even by one kilogram of commodity. It is absurd to think that Norway will move its fish via territory of Ukraine. Now we are conducting negotiations with Israel, with Canada, with Turkey about free trade area. Why these agreements do not call any problems, any questions on the part of our partners from Customs Union? And Customs Union countries themselves, are they not conducting talk like that? Are they not going to conclude similar agreements with number of countries? It seems to me that all those questions are issued by norms of World Trade Organizations. They are regulated well enough, and we are quite sure and we are ready to provide our calculations that signing agreement on association does not provide any risk to countries of Customs Union. Moreover, we are ready to discuss that in particular. And second, we are ready to set up a commission to define joint certificates of origin, to establish joint uh, customs control posts. Our patience and our desire now is to get out of this situation because we understand the importance of trade and economic relations with customs union countries. It's of great significance, just 40% of our goods turnover. And even now we feel already it's quite well, especially under the circumstances of recession and European economy as well, and our economy suffered. The delivery of some commodities to customs union countries were reduced. So we're having applying efforts, and we shall continue putting efforts to establish better cooperation with customs union countries. On Wednesday, I decided to travel to Astana to the meeting of customs union council, the meeting we had the level of prime ministers. Thus, I want to demonstrate, although our country is an observer, we are ready to work with customs union country, establishing cooperation. We have a calm attitude to number of political statements made. Some time ago, a famous French politician, Talleyrand, said that language is given for diplomats to hide their thoughts. And, uh, when there is nothing to say, so this statement sounds even more important. The shortage of what to say should have convinced some of the authors of loud statements that sometimes it's better to be tacit and to make a pause and take some acceptable relations, well-balanced and reasonable position of Ukrainian leadership shows that we do not react to some uh, sometimes even diplomatically unacceptable statements just because of one reason, because our strategic interests are not to allow emotions to prevail over reasonable economic solutions. Thank you for your attention, and I'm ready to answer your questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Prime Minister. Uh, forgive me for asking the first question in English. 
Uh, I will just wait perhaps while you put on your translation kit. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, that was such an interesting presentation because you talked so much about the reforms that and the modernizations within the Ukrainian economy, but you also talked about the, the political framework. My question to you picks up on your talk about the, the difficult conversations with the customs union. In the end, do you think it will come down to a choice? Do you think Ukraine, if it goes ahead uh, with the free trade agreement, the association agreement with Europe, is going to have a more difficult relationship with the customs union, or do you believe that you can, in the end, have both integration to the West and maintain free trade and integration to the East as well? Can you have both? You are absolutely right when, in fact, in your question, you provided the answer. You told all that I wanted to say. Absolutely, we shall find the necessary consensus, the necessary mutual understanding. Uh, we cannot get away from each other. We are destined for cooperation with customs union countries. This difficult period will pass over of understanding each other, of adaptation. We have been cooperating, we shall continue cooperating even now. I mentioned that many times publicly. I can only repeat it again. We are ready to join some of the provisions of the current norms of the customs union that firstly, do not run counter to our constitution, and that facilitate development of bilateral trade. We are ready to conduct such negotiations and to regulate all that in the normal uh, a green atmosphere. It does require goodwill on the other side. Do you believe sufficient goodwill is there right now? I believe yes. You might have heard some rather more negative noises coming from Moscow, but do you think that is purely politics? I have responded to all negative statements. I expressed my opinion. Sometimes it's better to be tacitant when you don't uh, know what to tell, especially. Um, let, let, let me ask you one more very brief question, and then I want to give people an opportunity to ask their own, uh, because we don't have so much time. My final question to you is this. You, you talked a lot about the ways in which Ukrainian industry is reforming itself. You talked about new standards for, across pharmaceuticals, many other industries. We see that transformation underway. Do you believe that institutionally, in terms of governance, Ukraine is keeping up with what is being achieved actually on the ground in many industries, many parts of your economy? Is the governance keeping up? with the transformation in the industrial sectors? We have conducted the administrative reform, reduced considerably, first of all, the bureaucratic staff and number of ministries and agencies. The staff of the cabinet of ministers was reduced two times, the number of people who work there. Compared with the European offices, our cabinet of ministers is quite small if we compare the number. But it's actually not the number of institutions, not the number of staff or bureaucrats that are working, but quality of decisions taken. And here, a lot of work is ahead. But I think. Well, Leonid Danilovich knows that I am in government for quite a long time. I was in the government and then in opposition, and my political activity is about 20 years already. 
I have what to compare with. So when comparing, I can conclude that we are moving in the right direction. And the quality of decisions taken, on the one hand, is getting improved. But on the other hand, of course, there are some contradictions that should be removed further. Uh, to say it briefly, when speaking openly, a lot of work is ahead. And to say that I am fully satisfied with the level of work of the staff and our bureaucracy, our ruling structures, I cannot say that. But on the other hand, probably that is right. If I say that everything is OK, you would not be, believe me anyway. True, yes. But Nonetheless, I appreciate your honesty in, in that assessment. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I don't have so much time to play with on this opening session, but I have a, a couple of minutes uh, in which I can offer you the opportunity to ask a question direct to the Prime Minister. So if anybody would like to put a question, I would like you to raise your hand and I will make sure it gets to the Prime Minister straight away. Otherwise, I'm going to ask another one myself, and that's a warning to you all, so you might want to stop me doing that. Um, would anybody like to ask, ah, sir, let's get the microphone to you. Uh, good morning, I'm Burakovsky, Institute of Economic Studies. I have an easy question. Mr. Glazian, his publication is talking about great economic loss for Ukraine if Ukraine exceeds EU and is in free trade area. Uh, Mr. Azarov, are you afraid of such calculations? First of all, I know these calculations. They are on my table. They have been analyzed not only by me, but by our specialists as well. And it seems like you and your institute have participated in the uh, analysis. So you asked, in fact, a rhetoric question for yourself. What can I say? When assessing the different forecasts that are now broadly disseminated media. I recollect the years when we were preparing to accession to World Trade Organization. You remember that very well. It was almost same situation, same apocalyptic forecasts were prescribed. But we have made all calculations. Of course, we had some losses. But at the same time, just look how hugely our export has grown, how our enterprises uh, were forced to get adjusted to free trade, to invest money in modernization. Of course, when we open our market, and we are opening our market quite slowly, I think you probably know the figures. European Union is reducing import duties almost to zero, almost immediately, canceling uh, subsidies for agriculture. That was the most difficult issue in our negotiations with Mr. De Bucht, from Director General on Trade of European Commission. And we, in the course of about five years, are reducing the duties uh, almost two times, two, two and a half percent. Um, it's not too much, but still there is some kind of protection. I have mentioned that already, but I want to repeat again. The biggest problem for us is time and money. Money needed for modernization and time within which we are obliged to conduct this modernization. It's clear if we do not reconstruct our, our open house uh, and do not replace it with the more modern methods of melting steel, this equipment will stop functioning. Everybody should understand that. But when we were conducting negotiations with the European Commission, we contacted and we consulted with absolutely all industrialists, both big businesses and associations of businesses, and we discussed in detail all the possible risks not quite long ago, it was last Monday that I got together once again, all of them, including representatives of trade unions and confederation of employers and big industrial associations, all those who were engaged, and asked a simple question. Are you sharing 
the information mentioned in media about catastrophic consequences. I want to hear your open and sincere opinion. None of them, none of them did say that they agree with such conclusions. There were certain proposals made, and we shall take them into account, but none of the people present said that they agree with such uh, catastrophic consequences. And uh, sincerely speaking, I am quite sure that even one-tenth of what is forecasted will not happen. There will be no such bad consequences. What we are supposed to do within 10 next year, we go through a very difficult way, but there is no alternative for that. I'm deeply convinced of that. No alternative for us, for Ukraine. I'm just looking around. I don't see another hand. Oh, well, I, oh, no, that's not true. I do see hands. I'm going to have to make this the last one, because otherwise I'm going to get in terrible timekeeping trouble. So just at random, sir, I'll take you at the front. If you wouldn't mind, sir, introducing yourself. Very quick question if you would, because we're almost out of time. Eugen um, Bistritsky, International Renaissance Foundation. A very clear, simple question. You were talking about bureaucracy of European uh, c Commission, but we know that European bureaucracy is more transparent. There is no conflict of interests. And that speaks to the level of corruption, too. What is your vision, since we are signing or could be signing association agreement, how will and in what direction and with what instrument are you going to decrease the level of corruption of our democracy? There are several questions combined in one uh, question of yours, and we are addressing this issue in different ways. I am firmly convinced that punishment is uh, just one way of addressing this issue, but it's not my cup of tea. What I'm uh, in charge of is establishing such regulatory rules and conditions that would make decision-making totally transparent, uh, rooting out any corruption and making all um, decisions controlled by the public. For example, public procurement, the area which is believed to be the most corrupt or uh, to be most prone uh, for corruption. So we should ensure that any tender uh, is conducted transparently, openly, with full publication of the materials and publicizing of the results. You can have 10 police officers guarding uh, the work, uh, everyday work of a bureaucrat. It reminds me of a very interesting anecdote uh, from Lloyd. Um Back in the Soviet times, the trains that went to uh, the Caucasus uh, were very popular, and it was almost impossible to buy tickets for those trains. And the um, attendants um, caught up some of the passengers without tickets, and they just took some tips from them. So uh, Mr. Shevard Narsa, who was uh, the party leader, Communist Party uh, leader uh, in Georgia, thought of placing police uh, officers in every train to control uh, that the uh, train attendants would not allow people without tickets to board. Once I was on, on board such a train, I had a ticket to Tbilisi, but when the train was uh, staying at a station for three minutes and I uh, approached my uh, carriage, it was uh, locked. I knocked on the, uh, on the window and the uh, train attendant said, uh, there are no, uh, no uh, places or there are no seats on the uh, plane. So I uh, entered my uh, own carriage and it was half empty. So there were seats uh, on the train. And I said, why did you buy uh, the ticket, my dear one? You could, should have told me, Katso, uh, I need to go to Tbilisi, and uh, then you will um, uh, be picked up on the train. Uh, next morning, I noticed um, a police officer walking along the corridor, and he looked very strange, as if he had been drinking uh, vodka all night. Uh, then he went to the um, train attendant, they spoke uh, for several minutes, and then uh, on he went. That, uh, that, that's a real-life anecdote, and I uh, mentioned it just uh, to show that 
punitive measures do not resolve any issue. What we need is a, a procurement controlled by the society, um, transparent rules of the game. Of course, um, public institutions should respond to all petitions, to all um, um, recriminations, to all uh, complaints. But uh, you should believe me that no reform is implemented or uh, no tenders are uh, conducted at, uh, at the top. And we do not approve of any corrupt practices. I want to assure you about that and that we will bring uh, those who are um, guilty to account. What we need is transparent rules of the game. Thank you very much for your attention. I wish uh, success to your conference. But sure, but Prime Minister Azarov, thank you so much indeed, Prime Minister.